Welcome to Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. I am your host, Joy Vacherbeck. This is my co-host, Mark Renahan. How you doing, Joy? I'm good, Mark. How are you? I'm fantastic. We've been away for a while. Nice we have. So welcome back to 2022. I'd say Happy New Year, but we're now into February already. Yeah, yes. so. <laughs> we've, we've been busy, but we're back. <laughs> we are. We are. And we are also welcoming back Alan Dowd, our senior fellow here at American Security Council Foundation. Welcome How you doing, back, Alan? Hi, Joy. Hi, Joy. Hi, Mark. Good to be back. Good. And- it's uh, Happy Valentine's or Happy yeah. President's Yeah, we're Day. now getting to that area. <laughs> we'll do Happy yeah. President's, Happy Valentine's. I don't, right. Do we miss anything in January? President's when was Martin Luther King Day? That was MLK think, and yeah, uh, that was, yes, that was yes, New yes, Year's. Yes, we just yeah. had that. Happy we Martin just Luther had King that. Day yes, also. Yeah. We missed yep. that. So anyway, <laughs> Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, always good to be back and good to chat with you guys, uh, Mark. We had uh, Reagan's birthday, obviously February sixth. Oh, that's a big right, one for that one that's a big one for American Security Council yes. folks. So. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Uh, Peace through strength. Mm-hmm. That's right. So good to be back. Well, Alan, we uh, we had you on today, and, and today's going to probably be talking to Joy a little bit more because she's a, a little bit more of an expert on the subject. But it's to talk about Ukraine. And before we dig into the uh, really academic part of it i was curious um you know i know you were writing about nato in your recent article Mm -hmm. and how they're rejecting putin's demands but i wanted to before we start on that if i was somebody listening to this show and i was a lay person who only has heard about ukraine and russia through news reports Mm -hmm. you know or whatever's flashing across my social media and i ran into alan alan dowd having a cup of coffee and i said alan i keep seeing all this stuff about ukraine and russia could you tell right. me what's going on as quick as possible so I have an idea why this war might happen? Any way you could do that? Uh, a kind of an elevator speech on Ukraine, <laughs> Russia, uh, of uh, 2,000 years of history or something. Uh, there's, uh, I would say the, the quick thumbnail is that Ukraine wants and has wanted to be, since 1991, a sovereign, independent country. Russia wants now and has wanted Ukraine for at least the last uh, 10, 15 years to not be a fully sovereign country and wants to have Ukraine cleaved to or an appendage of Russia for a couple reasons. One reason is there are a lot of ethnic Russians in Ukraine, which Putin makes a big deal about. Mm. And another reason, though, I think the, the broader reason is that Ukraine's sovereignty or Ukraine's independence uh, is something that, in a sense, from Putin's perspective, not every Russian, but from Putin's perspective, uh, undermines the notion that Russia is a great power, uh, that, that uh, without Ukraine, Russia, in Putin's view, is, is not uh, the historically great Russia of the past. So I think that'd be my short answer. And, and so you can imagine those two differences are so far apart. Ukraine wants to be independent and sovereign, and has been, since 91 and russia doesn't want that or putin's russia doesn't want that russia did in you know after the fall of the soviet union that russia openly and allowed and encouraged ukraine to become an independent country and and it did for a time obviously had a close relationship with russia but um i think that would be the crux of the difference does that make sense yeah no yes, it makes yes. a ton of sense and that, hey, that, excuse me i'm the engineer and uh i thought also isn't ukraine has a deep water port that Russia has not. And even today with them redoing their, uh, trying to overhaul their only carrier, it's very difficult for them to do in their location. So they need some of the resources like uh, in Ukraine. I, I think that, that there's a, uh, a, uh, a geostrategic element to it. I was talking more about the historical or uh, just uh, power politics of it. But, yeah, the, it, the Black Sea is uh, important to Russia. Russia has territory all around the Black Sea. Of course, in 2014, when a lot of these troubles began, Russia seized Crimea, uh, which basically gave Russia the access to the, the, the Russia annex, the Sea of Azov, which feeds into the Black Sea, and then uh, took all of those uh, naval facilities at Sevastopol, uh, which is the Crimea. So, yeah, that's, I would say that'd be a, a factor, too. Uh, and then Russians and Ukrainians debate whether Crimea should ever have been part of Russia or should ever have been part of Ukraine, that it was given as a gift to Russia or given as a gift to Ukraine uh, from Russia. It's a, there's a long story about that, too. But, yeah, I think that's a, a, a good point, that there's a, 
there's a, uh, a geostrategic element to it uh, with those Black Sea ports. Certainly there is. But and well, let's bring it back to your paper here that um, NATO must firmly reject Putin's demands. Yes. Um, as we know, and this was put up on our website, www.ascf.us, back in January. Um, but as we know now, Putin is not getting the demands he's asking for. NATO is not giving in to them, and as is the U.S. Um, in your opinion, how far do you think the U.S. should go in defending uh, NATO territory and stabilizing the security situation in Europe? Well, two things. First off, that's a, that's a credit to ASCF. You know, we were, uh, our team was ahead of the curve on this, and it was great that you guys gave me as part of the team a platform to say NATO must right away reject these demands. I wrote that piece in December. You guys, uh, we were able to publish it first week of January, and that's exactly what NATO did. Uh, NATO came together. Hard to get 30 countries on the same page. Uh, they did firmly rejected uh, uh, Putin's, uh, which I would call fairly outrageous demands. I can talk about those in a moment. But um, so that was a great thing, and that's a credit to ASCF and the platform you we you guys have and we have. Um, second part is uh, how far should NATO go in defending NATO territory? That's the question you asked. Uh, if you meant NATO territory, I think you did, Joy. That's a big difference from Ukrainian territory because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. A lot of people right. uh, who are listening, I'm sure, know that. Um, so there's a big difference there. So there's diff- So I, as the, the, that essay I wrote, talked a little bit about some of the distinctions there. There are things that we have to do, I think, as a treaty partner to NATO ne- members and things that uh, we probably shouldn't do because membership has its privileges as the old saying goes i don't know if that was a credit card company in the 80s or whatever but uh, it affects it affects uh, ukraine too so defending nato territory i think what the biden administration has started to coordinate the last couple weeks and with several allies the brits are leading are right there with us mm-hmm. uh france spain the Balts, uh estonia latvia lithuania uh, poland uh, are doing quite a bit to just basically in a sense shore up or bolster NATO's eastern flank. I think that's very important. Uh, some more fighter bombers in the air. You saw the eight elements of the 82nd Airborne in Poland um, uh, to uh, shore some things up. Uh, there's some new... Uh, NATO has something called an air policing mission over the Baltic state, which are members of NATO, which basically is a rotating group of fighter bombers from many of the countries. So we NATO sent some more of those planes there to... to protect Baltic airspace. Um, So all those things I think are very important just in prudent defense, you know, uh, and Putin can say all he wants that, uh, you know, I I don't want a war. I don't want this. His, the record shows actions speak louder than words. The record shows he's already lopped off part of Ukraine. He occupied, he has troops in Moldova, Ukraine and Georgia, which none of those countries want his troops there. He's attacked in cyber ways, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Baltic states, he threatened nuclear war against NATO members, mm-hmm. uh, which is stuff we thought was a thing of the Cold War. It's not. And then he's just thrown 100,000 troops and 1,200 tanks on Ukraine's borders, which, by the way, if you look at a map, uh, Belarus, which is kind of an appendage of Russia now, um, is a is a border state to uh, Poland and Lithuania. Those mm-hmm. are NATO members. So these are prudent. I would say what NATO's doing uh, uh, is prudent planning and putting defensive operations yes and well let's sorry no go ahead uh, get to the touchy subject here is that russia does have some leverage with the oil and gas supplies to some of yes. these nato nations uh specifically to um this new nord stream 2 that the biden administration just said that they would absolutely cut off from my understanding right. 